If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to John chapter 5. We're going to be finishing up John 5 uh, today. And um, if you've been getting in, it was actually in the email yesterday, our call it Central Connection. I thought it was a nice, catchy uh, a name. But uh, there in that email, if you have it, you can click on that and it'll pull up the sermon notes uh, for uh, today. You can also follow along on, on the screens. But uh, today's message is titled, Prove It. Prove it. You know, imagine that uh, that uh, we were in a courtroom. You know, one thing that I've uh, I've wanted to do. I've never had the opportunity to to do so. But it, it it sounds good on the front end. But those of you that have experienced it probably would uh, speak otherwise. But that would be to serve on a jury. Uh, to have to have jury duty. I'm getting a, I'm getting a no in in the back there, and uh, and I would say you know 99 percent of the trials that you ever see would just be utter uh, you know just boring uh, completely. But just think, uh, you, maybe you might get something that's juicy or exciting, something where you might have to to make a really tough and and big decision. Well, today. All of us are going to have the opportunity to sit in a courtroom, and you can picture you're over and to the side in, in the jury's box, as each and every one of us are a jury, or a juror, listening to a court case that not just has the fate of just one person, but really has the fate of all humanity in its in its hands. For we know in the last couple of weeks we've, we've been in John 5 where, where Jesus was, uh, was, was healing. He healed the, the lame man at, uh, at the pool and he told him to get up and to take his mat and to go in, in, and to walk. And the religious leaders that were there at the temple asked this man, what, you know, what, why are you walking, are you carrying this mat on the Sabbath, right? It's it's against God's law to work on the Sabbath. And, and, and this lame man blames it on Jesus. Well, this, this Jesus guy, he, well, I didn't, he, that moment he didn't know, but he said, he's the one that, that healed me. He's, it's, it's him. He, he's the one that, uh, that, that caused uh, me to, to sin on the Sabbath. And then Jesus, last week we saw as we were in the middle of chapter 5, where, where Jesus is no longer being questioned by these Pharisees, the Sadducees, he's, now it, it's moved on to accusations. And we're kind of in this section in John's gospel where it, it goes from curiosity to where the plan begins to, to put Jesus to death because they fear him. So today we're going to be looking in John chapter 5, verses 30 through 47 to the end of this chapter. And as we, as we look through this, this narrative, this court scene, have you, we're going to see that Jesus is, is put on trial. And as any good um, defense would have is you must have evidence to back up your claims. So the claim that Jesus made, we saw in last week, is that He is God. And it is this claim that is going to get Him, get him killed. But it is a, a true claim. But it, anybody could just say, look, I'm, I am God, and we've seen throughout history that there have been many cults that have been, uh, that have, uh, been uh, created with this idea. But, but Jesus is different. For he is able to back up this claim, not just with himself, but he has witnesses. You know, in today's crime scene, if you watch any crime show, you know that, that forensic evidence is, um, is, is important, especially things dealing with like DNA and, and we're able to go back and to trace, um, you know, with either to uh, c- confirm a conviction or in, in some cases they've been, they've been overturned. But back in, in biblical times, they, they didn't have the CSI that could go in and dust stuff off and, to, you know, to or look at ballistics on, on, you know, certain things. No, they, they relied on witness testimony. And in fact, based on Scripture, the, the, the Hebrew law, that in order to prove oneself, it, you couldn't just have one witness. No, you must have two cooperating 
witnesses. As we see here in John chapter 5, Jesus provides not just two witnesses, but we see three witnesses to his validity, to his affirmation that he indeed is the Son of God. And the first witness that we see is John the Baptist. John, John the Baptist. Look here at verses 30 through, through 35. It says, Jesus speaking here, he says, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and not my judgment is just, because I, I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. See, John the Baptist was the forerunner to Jesus. His role was to prepare the way for the Messiah to, to come. And he did so. He fulfilled his role, his, his duty. See, John the Baptist was a rabbi. He was respected, at least for a while, by the, the Jewish religious leaders. And in fact, he was, he was a prophet. He was the, the last prophet that we have transcending from the Old Testament into the New Covenant, which was inaugurated through, through Jesus. So John the Baptist, this respected rabbi, this prophet, foretold that Jesus was the Christ. Now, not only did he predict that Jesus would come, that he would be the Son of God, but, but he witnessed it himself. We remember the scene where, where John was baptizing and Jesus comes along, and as John baptizes Jesus, what happens? The heavens open up, and you could audibly hear the voice of God. This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. John the Baptist ended up giving his life. It wasn't much, uh, John, uh, the uh, author John of this gospel doesn't speak, but the other gospels um, will, will tell us that, that John was, was beheaded um, by uh, the king's uh, sister. And so, and so John the Baptist is this first witness to that Jesus is the Son of God. We see the second witness is, is Jesus himself. Not, it's, not, it's not only Jesus' words, but also what he has, has done. So now Jesus no longer is you know, John the Baptist on the stand. Now Jesus himself is, is taking the stand. See, Jesus doesn't plead the Fifth Amendment. He doesn't want to incriminate himself. No, actually, he runs head first into the very claim that gets him killed. Let's look here at John chapter 5, verse 36. He says, but the testimony that I have, right, John, Jesus has, is, is what? It's greater than that of John, John the Baptist. For why? For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. Now these religious leaders, they, they knew what Jesus had, had done. Word has gotten out about Jesus. He is no longer in a hiding because of, uh, of hiding, concealing these miracles like he was when he turned the, the water into the wine or healed the official's son. He wasn't. Now it, everything's out in, in the open. And these officials, they, they've heard Jesus teach in the synagogue with, with authority. He knows things that, that they don't know after they've given their lives to studying the Scriptures. 
And now Jesus is saying, look, all you have to do is, is look to me. Look, I, I heal. I can, I can bring the, the dead to, to life, and I can turn water into wine. But now, part of I think it may be a little difficult for these religious people to, to, to grasp, to understand. We're going to see it a little later on when Jesus kind of turns the tables on, on, on these uh, Pharisees. It's because, it's because Jesus is attitude his his demeanor is is far different than anything that they themselves practice nor anything they've ever they've ever seen see one would think that you know by by doing these miracles by healing it is to so that you can gain a following Right, so that you can become a a, a rock star so to speak back in the the first century uh, Jerusalem and this is what the, the religious system was designed to be because let me tell you, if you did not have to, uh, uh, if you were looking into a crowd of people, you could easily pick out who the rabbis were, who those who studied the scriptures, who knew it. For one, they looked differently. They made sure to dress so that they don't look like the commoners. But also they, they talked in a, in, a, in a pompous, almost an arrogant attitude as if they know everything and really you know nothing. You have to come to them in order to, to be able to, to gain that special knowledge. And it's even more different than, than really even we could, uh, that we even experience here today because, well, we, yes, we, we study the scriptures for them. The scripture was their legal system as well. So when they say that, man, it is against God's law for you to carry this mat and walk, well, look, I mean, you can flip through the Bible pages. You're not going to see anything in there that says that it's illegal to carry a, a mat. No, what they've done is they've created all of these extra laws, and, but yet they're also the arbiters of those laws. And so Jesus is saying, look, John the Baptist John the Baptist testified. This man that, that you guys, he was one of you. He, he testified about me. And you can, you can take his testimony as, as truth and then look at, at what I've done. But then the third, the third evidence of Jesus' divinity is probably the most... Um, the most, I think the most concrete, but also the one that is the most troubling for these religious people. For the third witness is, is the word of God. Look here at verse 37, the first part of it. It says, And the Father, God who sent me, has himself borne witness about me. Now, obviously, no one has seen God and was able to, to live by it. So how, what does Jesus mean here by, look, my, you have seen through my Father. My Father is the one. He, he's born witness about me. What Jesus is saying is everything that you have given your life for, the Hebrew Bible, the books of, of the law, the thing that you know so much about, the thing that, that, that you look down on others for not following it as good as you can follow it, everything that you know points to me. The Word of God from Moses, who is the author of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, he himself foretells of the coming Messiah, Jesus being the one, and all of the prophets. And we've, we've gone through many of them, and, and so clearly they point that Jesus is the Son of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. And so this scene, this courtroom really, I mean, it really is. They're in the temple at this moment. So this is where they would adjudicate legal cases in, in, the, in the temple. And, and so now, though, Jesus goes from, 
from sitting at the defense table. And now he turns the tables completely on the religious leaders. And they now have to sit at the defense and to, to see whether or not they believe that what Jesus says is true. And the same is true for us. You know, there's some passages, and I love the Gospel of John for so many reasons. I love the narratives in it. And I mean, next week we're going to get into Jesus feeding the 5,000. I mean, some of the most amazing miracles that you see, some of the most comforting um, uh, words that, that Jesus speaks are found in, in John's Gospel. But, but one cannot read the Gospel of John and remain neutral. It's one you can't just, you, you have to choose a side or the other. Now, obviously, we do not do that on our own, as we saw last week, for it is Jesus, the one who saves. So he is the one who calls us. We hear his voice. But, but when he speaks, we must, we must respond. So look here at verse 37b. We, we see this word. It says, his voice... His voice you have never heard. His form you have never seen. Now whose voice is this? The voice of God. These are men of God. And he's saying, look, you have never heard His voice. Nor have you seen and you do not have His word abiding in you. For you do not believe the one whom He has sent. You. Search the Scriptures because you think that in them you, you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. Wow. I have come. In my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. No, there is one who accuses you. Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote of me. But if you do not believe in his writings, then how will you believe my words? Wow. Talk about turning the tables figuratively here. If these religious leaders weren't riled up yet... <laughs> I have a feeling this, this really got, got the blood, got their blood flowing. So we see here this evidence between against these religious leaders, right? In 37, it's right, they they have never, they have never heard him. They've never heard God. They have never seen God. They do not have the word abiding in them. And they do not believe in the one whom he has sent. So no longer is he defending himself, but he is bringing about charges against these religious leaders. Basically, he's saying, you guys are frauds. For you reject the very one that you seek to know. We know for to be a rabbi, and especially in the ruling uh, party of the, of the Sadducees there at the temple, I mean, they would very likely have the entire Old Testament memorized. They knew the law, but, but what does Jesus say where their hope was found? It wasn't found in what the law testifies to, but it was found in, in the book itself. And that's a danger for us, too. No, that's a, it's a danger. Look, we are a, a people of, of the book. 
All right. I mean, look, the, uh, the Bible is the, um, the, the inerrant, authoritative, sufficient word of God. When we believe that the Bible speaks, we believe that God speaks. But this book cannot save you. It's possible to know this book forwards and backwards. And I have read several people that know, honestly, they know the Bible better, but they, they reject they reject it. See, just understanding, just knowing that this, this book does not save, but it is the message that this book is about that brings salvation. So yes, we need to be in the Word. Why do we need to be in the Word? Because that is how God has revealed Himself to us. Look, we have greater evidence than, than those from, from history predating Jesus on, even those that were walked among Him. Why? Because we know, we know the end of the story. But he, he died the death that we deserve, but he defeated death and he rose from the grave. And he, whoa, he appeared to, uh, fly maybe, but he appeared to over 500 witnesses, all right? Again, witnesses. And so we need to be a people of the word. And, and I, you know, it's Bible study is, is, is very important and, and, um, and, and sometimes digging, but we need to make sure that the Word is, is a part of our devotional life, too. Uh, that, you know, sometimes we, 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 feel, we feel guilty. Uh, you know, we, you start in January, you got your Bible reading plan, and, you know, by, you know, by maybe February, you, you've already messed it up, and then by March, it's like, let's just throw it out, and I'll just try it again next year. And and we live by because honestly, it's more for us and, and you know, trying to feel like we've accomplished uh, something. But the purpose of, of reading through the Bible is not so that we can get a plaque that says, look how many times I've read through the Bible. That sounds almost like what Jesus is speaking against. But we read the Bible so that we can commune with God. You know, the Bible is, is an amazing a book. It is many books, many different types of, of literature, many different genres. But it is the only book that speaks to us. It knows us. And when we read the Word of God, God speaks to us through it. So may we stay in the Word. And yes, we need to study the Word. If we don't know, if we come to parts, and if you've been a Christian long enough, you're going to come to parts of the Bible, look where you're just like, this just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Look, seek it out. Search it yourself, and then go find others to, to help to help you to, to understand what it is saying and, and pray that God would bring you to that understanding. But we must be in the Word, not like the Pharisees were. But we be in the Word so that, one, that we can experience the saving faith that comes through the message of Scripture. And that's why, you know, on my Thursday night Bible study, we can call it Through the Word, because when I started, we were in Gen Genesis, and we're working our way all the way through the Bible. We're now in uh, finishing up the Gospels. And, uh, and in every lesson that we go through, we see how... All of the Bible points to Jesus. He is the hero. This is what the book is about. It's about Jesus from Genesis to Revelation and everywhere in between. And, and so if you read Scripture and you don't see Jesus, then we're not reading it correctly. So we need to be in the Word, but yet we do not need to hold the Word of God above that with which it is about. And that can be a temptation for us. We also need to read it in the right spirit, with a humble 
spirits. We don't need to hold it over others. How many of you, and I'm guilty of it, especially with children, when, you know, when, you, when a child does something and you, you throw out a Bible verse, says, hey, you shouldn't do that, right? Because Why? Because the Bible says so. And then only to find ourselves really guilty of the same thing the next day. <laughs> now, yes, we need to call sin, sin, but we need to make sure that we, that we also are convicted of ourselves when we fall short of God's glory. And so we see that, that Jesus is, is saying to these, these learned, more these uh, men, look, you, you don't have the love of God within you. Why? Because they reject Jesus, the Son. So this is further confirmation that in order to love God, you have to love Jesus. Later on, John 14, 6, this is one of those verses that do us well to, to alarm, memorize it. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but, but through me. Now, how all that works, there is a mystery to salvation. We can't just maybe, you know, come down to a, a certain method, a process that we, we go to, but it does not come apart from Jesus. And so we must believe in Jesus for our sins. And we say, look here in verse 43, we also see that, that he says that if another comes in his own name, you will receive him. And then he says here, how can you believe when you receive glory from another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? For many of us, and I think for all of us, at certain points in times, I know it is my own self, that sometimes we fear others more so than we fear God. Jesus says to, to fear Him who can kill both the body and soul and condemn us to hell. But we don't fear God if we are in Christ, as, 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 a, as a kind of a dog fears a, an abusive owner, you know, with their tail between, no, it is, it is an acknowledgement, it is a respect of knowing that God has the power to control all things, and that we are just peons. But we're more than that, for we are loved, we are His children, we are His heirs. So Jesus goes through and he just, he's just accusing them point after point after point. And we see that sometimes it's, it's easy to, to miss the greatness in the midst of what we think is, is good. You know, picture that you're going to a fancy restaurant. I'll say it's holidays coming. Maybe it's your anniversary, special day, and, and you and you go and you you know it's, you, you get all dressed up. Maybe you know you might even put up on a bow tie. I mean, I'll lend you one if you if you need one. And and you get all dolled up and and, and you go and you you know it and you you, you get you get the car waxed and clean because it's one of those you know you got a valet. You can't just you know just pull in and and kind of a deal and um, no COVID at all. So you just leave the mask at home and and you go into the the restaurant and they you know you have the maitre d seats you you don't wait no you got reservations you go right in and and they seat you and they seat you in the in the, in the chair and then they they give you the menu and you look at it and oh it's not a very large menu for you know those really good restaurants they don't they don't do a lot but what they do is they do really well and you look at it and it's like yeah i think i'm gonna i'm not sure how to pronounce that but it looks good yeah uh, yeah well all of that stuff, and then they they bring out the the first course, and you eat, and it's like, yeah, yeah, this is good. And they bring out the the next course, and then they and then you get to the main dish, and then oh, the dessert is to oh, it's just a dive for. And then when you get home and, and you're, you're talking to your, your buddies, man, you should go to this rub, Ed. It is unreal. You should go. I can't, I mean, this is a place where you need to go. And then instead of talking about the food, 
All you do is, man, you should see those forks, those knives. I mean, you could just look, you know, I looked really good. I mean, I did have that hair out of place, but oh, and, and, and the, and the plates were, were, were nice. I looked on the back. They were not from, they, you know, they were really China. You know, it was made in real China. And, and, and the crystal, the, and, and, but you never talk about the food, which is why you went there in the first place. This pales in comparison to, <laughs> to the Word of God and, and Jesus, but... My fear is in my own life, and I think in many of our lives, especially when we've, when we've been in church so long, is that we begin to love all of the, the things of church. We, we love the building. It brings us comfort. We love the music and, and how the emotions that it brings us. We, we love the fellowship. We, we love the Bible study and digging deep into God's, God's word. And, and we love doing the outreach. And we love all of these things. But, but if we're not careful, we can begin to elevate the things of God higher than God himself. And that's what Jesus accuses these religious leaders who were very genuine in their faith. He's saying, I'm putting it a little nicer than he did, but is, look, you guys have missed the boat. You've missed it. You've... You're so focused on making sure that everybody follows each little law that, that you forget what it's really about. I'm the one that this is about. And yet you reject me. For all of us, we have to come to a point in our life where we choose to accept Christ. Or we reject Him. And when you hear Jesus call, when you hear that voice, there's nothing sweeter. It says, you can have all this world. You can, you know what, you can have our sit-down restaurants and you can have our get-togethers and... You can even have our Thanksgiving and holidays. You know what? Corona can take about anything they want. But it can't take Jesus away from us. I've just been just you know, really convinced. In fact, Jess and I were just talking about it this morning is, you know, we're coming up on, <laughs> you know, the other big holiday for the church, right? Christmas. <laughs> It quickly brought us back to the beginning of March, leading up to Easter. And how, I mean, just the week before, we were making plans for the Easter egg hunt and Palm Sunday and a big Easter celebration, and boom, it all went up like that. I don't know <laughs> what December is going to look like. But I do know that even if we're not able to be in the building, if we're not able to get together with family like we want. Look, look, we have Jesus. You know, it's kind of like driving with a, in your car every now and then. I, obviously, you can look at my car. I'm not uh, one of those that takes a pride in you know, buffing and make sure it's all waxed. And, but, you know, I, for, for safety reasons, I, you know, I like to put some Rain-X on there. And, you know, you're driving, you... Um, because even if your windshield wipers don't work, that rain X will keep the, the water off. And sometimes some of these things that are really good, things that, that honestly they point us to Jesus, but if we're not careful, they can cloud us of the true 
reason is. And it's become a catchphrase, and I'm sure it's on a shirt, and I can make you one if you want, but uh, you know, Jesus is the reason for the season. But it's true. And lastly, as we see here, is that, is that we, can, we can love the words of this book. We can love the one that it's about. But Jesus says that if you love me, then you will keep my commands. What good does it do to to study this, to say love on Jesus if we don't do what he tells us to do? So we must obey what we read. That's where we talk about meditating on the word of God. It's not so that it can, you know, at the right time that, you know, this is going to give me the power to overcome any obstacle that I, no, we meditate on God's, uh, God's word so that, one, we are kind of one with, with him, but, but also that, that we would listen and that we would do what he tells us to do. That's what I always try to when I read, and uh, I'm kind of thinking through for next year, not knowing what the year is going to, uh, to be like, but it's the first to be the year where we, we really work through the Word of God. And um, because uh, it's, one, it's very important, but it is, um, is you know, I think, it, I think it would be helpful for us, not so much in a knowledge mode, but as a, in a... Um, just a, a devotional type of 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 atmosphere to um, you know may not be able to go as many places as we once did and have some time on our hands and so um, to get into into the Word of God uh, so that so that we would hear Him that we would know Him more that we would love Him and that we would obey Him. Would you pray with me? Our dearly Father, God, we thank you for Jesus. Mm. God, we're thankful that, that Jesus stood secure. He stood firm in, in who he was, who he is. Even when things got... Uh, a little uh, difficult for him. He never shied away, but God, that he that he stood firm in the truth that he is the Son of God who comes to take away the sins of the world, even though that very claim with which he could deny and been all right, but he did so, and, he, and it cost him his life. But we know that throughout, without. The blood of Jesus, we would still be dead in our sins. God, I pray for those that are here. Uh, maybe they've read through the Bible front to cover to cover, sat in a pew for umpteen years and done a lot of great things for you, God, but, but they haven't trusted in your Son for their salvation. I pray today would be the day that they would hear your, the voice that they would repent and believe. God, I pray for all of us. God, I pray in these days where it just seems like it's just hard to navigate life. You don't know which way to go or which roadblock you're going to hit. But, but God, I pray that you would bring us clarity, not in the ways of the world, but in the truthfulness of your word. For God, it is how you have revealed yourself to us. And God, I pray that as we, as we love, love the Holy Scriptures, God, that it would not puff us up and make us just more knowledgeable, but God, that it would truly point us to, to Jesus. And God, that we would obediently, that we would obediently do what it says. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.